ever figure out slides, I'll be able to go into that. <laughs> um, but what I, do you think the slides will advance? So well, that seems to work. So uh, as we're filling time, you can, I'm hoping you can see the slide that talks about the breast program at Valley View and what our Valley View University series um, has lined up for education and interest. And then the next talk is going to be from the radiologist talking about mammograms um, and screening. Okay. Okay. I can't see myself, but that's okay. Um, and then you look fantastic. Okay, good. <laughs> and then, you know, nurse navigators, you'll hear from me again when we talk more about breast cancer. We're going to go into the treatments of breast cancers in the future. But today's topic is breast issues that matter to you. And as Dr. Butterfield so nicely set me up, there are a number of benign breast conditions that women can uh, notice and get very stressed and worried about that turn out not to be cancer. So I thought I would really focus on things that you on exam can notice yourself, starting with breast masses or lumps. So really what you can feel or what your doctor can feel on exam, nipple concerns from discharge or skin changes or something like that, and breast pain. That really will be the focus of what we talk about today. Um, I also am going to speak a little bit about abnormal mammograms and what the radiologist can see on their exam that could lead to further testing or recommendations. I will focus on education around these topics, the possibility of an increased cancer risk, which really only goes with the mammogram abnormalities and symptomatic relief, which is especially important when we talk about breast pain. So breast masses, what you can feel on exam. These are a description of the non-cancerous conditions that have no increased risk of breast cancer, of which you can see there are quite a few. So lumps, and I will go into a little further description about breast cysts, fibroadenomas, galactoseals, hamartomas, fat necrosis, and oil cysts. Um, and abscess, I'm not going to talk about much more. Uh, women can get infections within their breast, which are clearly infections because they're red and swollen but it's just another breast mass you can feel. A lipomas are fatty lumps that uh, you can get anywhere in your body, but if they're in the breast, it's just like anything, it just escalates the concern. Um, and it's, it's one you can usually tell a lipoma just by physical examination. And then nipple discharge or nipple changes, specifically discharge and skin changes will um, further describe. So breast masses, who gets these lumps? And it turns out many more women get non-cancerous lumps than breast cancer. So 50% of women over their lifetime can experience a non-cancerous lump. Uh, there's no clear pattern of risk factors associated with um, breast lumps. They don't seem to be really related to a woman's menstrual history or use of contraceptives. Seems like there might be an increased risk if women have a family history of breast cancer, but I also am a little suspicious whether women who have a family history of breast cancer are just more aware of their breast self exams. And then interestingly, and down the road, we'll talk about lifestyle and how important it is for reducing risk of breast cancer, but just starts with even physical activity in postmenopausal women will decrease the risk of even benign non-cancer breast conditions. And then age, it's, it's interesting, women who have non-cancer breast conditions tend to be younger than those who come in with a breast cancer. Um, it's the one time that I can see women, or even girls in, as in their you know, teens, um, who come in with a, a lump that's totally fine and benign, but needs to be worked up and diagnosed. So breast lumps, when I see a woman for a breast lump, I really try to distinguish both from her words, her primary care doctors and my exam, whether it's truly a lump you can feel, meaning a discrete mass that you can kind of separate from all the other tissue within the breast versus lump B. And lumpy is kind of like it sounds like the whole breast is lumpy. And sometimes there'll be something a little bit more prominent but it has a very different feel than a lump. 
lumpy breast tissue is really common. That goes with the dense breast tissue that we so, so many of us feel. Um, and it's by far and away benign fibrocystic changes that doesn't really need any further evaluation or reassurance for. So when you come in with a lump, start with evaluation, which most often includes a physical examination, a description of symptoms, like when did this show up? And is it, are you tender? Does it come and go a little bit? And then think about treatment. So starting with breast cysts, which are really common, they are a fluid filled round thing within the breast, which can occur as a single cyst. It can, you can have several you know, small cysts. It's sort of like an exaggeration of fibrocystic breast tissue. Uh, these can be palpable. And interestingly, they can um, appear quite suddenly and being quite sore. So when a woman comes in and tells me that, you know, I didn't have this last night. And then this morning I was taking a shower and all of a sudden I felt a grape in my breast. By far and away, those turn out to be cysts. Um, they are absolutely totally benign. And I often tell women, I would love to see, you know, breast cysts all day long because it's the one time I don't worry at all. Um, we never do surgery for breast cysts because it's, it, it's a total breast issue. So you can take one cyst out, they'll get another one. So you, or you'll get another one. So I don't do surgery on those. If it's um, very uncomfortable and they can get quite large, we can um, drain these cysts by either just feeling it and putting a needle in it and draining it with some local anesthesia here in the office, or sometimes um, an ultrasound with a radiologist is helpful because that can really say, yes, this is a cyst. And again, if it's problematic, if it's symptomatic, it can be drained. For cysts that are not felt, um, that are found just with a mammogram, uh, I tend not to do much with them because they, they can resolve on their own. Uh, cysts are interesting because they're very limited in time, you know, in age. Um, it's sort of around uh, the age is 35 to 50. I actually will sort of think maybe more towards 60 that women will get breast cysts. And then for whatever reason, hormones change, something about breast consistency changes and cysts stop appearing, which is lovely, especially for women who have multiple recurrent cysts. It's nice to know that there's an end point. Uh, fibroadenomas are another very common breast lump. They seem to be uh, somehow hormone related because most often women are seen during their reproductive years. Um, there are very young girls, 10, 11, 12, who can come in with what's called a juvenile fibroadenoma, which can enlarge pretty significantly over a short period of time to women probably before the age of menopause always, where you can feel a very discreet, um, distinctive, palpable lump. Um, I will describe these as sort of being sort of slippery within the breast. So they have a very distinctive feel to them, um, feel totally benign because they kind of roll around under your fingers. They are not at all, there's no increased risk of a breast cancer with fibroadenomas, but I will usually have um, an ultrasound done just to be sure that it's got the characteristics of a fibroadenoma. And then often I'll use a needle biopsy just to confirm that diagnosis and then give, uh, give you a choice of whether you are comfortable you know, living with it or whether you want it removed. And it's, it is interesting because I see, um, you know, again, young women who are college age who will say, oh yeah, I have a fibroadenoma, but then they'll come home at Christmas and say, I'm gonna just get it out because it's driving me crazy. I keep checking it and um, it bothers me. Surgery's really quite simple, you know, Again, one of the worries anytime we do surgery on the breast is that it's going to cause a big scar and a big dent. But these lumps come out very clearly. They're really separate from the rest of the breast tissue, and you end up looking just fine afterwards. A less common are galactoseals or milk retention cysts. As you can imagine from the name, this is something that occurs during breastfeeding because it's the result of an obstructed milk duct that um, then backs up the milk and forms a palpable lump within the breast. Usually it doesn't appear to be infected. Um, it's just a soft kind of smushy feeling lump there. 
mammogram ultrasound, or ultrasound mammogram are not very helpful in a woman who's breastfeeding. Ultrasound can sometimes show that there's fluid in there similar to cyst. If there's any concern beyond what you expect examining a, a woman, then we could put a needle in there and drain um, the fluid out. And it's, it's milky fluid, which is no surprise. I often will not do that during breastfeeding because weirdly, um, once you put a needle into it, you can start having what's called a milk fistula where the um, milk as you're lactating can actually go out through that needle hole and it can be very irritating. Um, these go away once you stop breastfeeding. Hamartomas are another, again, another totally benign lump in the breast. Um, these are complicated uh, tissue, almost like a separate breast within a breast, for lack of a better term. Really very clear edges on them, very distinct appearance on ultrasound. And if there's a need for confirmation, an ultrasound guided biopsy can be done, which will clearly show a hamartoma. No need for surgery unless it's bothersome. Sometimes these can be quite large, like several inches across. And a lot of times uh, it's women will like those to be taken out rather than have to keep checking them. A fat necrosis and oil cysts are two um, odd sounding things that we can feel within the breast. A fat necrosis is um, kind of dense scar tissue that can happen as a result of a breast injury. So women who have been in a car accident, it's a pretty common story where they get a big, huge breath, uh, a bruise on their breast from the seatbelt and then are left with a palpable lump you can feel that can feel really pretty weird. Um, oil cysts are the same thing where it's just, it's a result of injury. We also see it as the result of surgery. Um, for a woman who's had surgery and radiation, sometimes you can get this fat necrosis. It's not something that is ever treated surgically. It doesn't have an increased risk of breast cancer, but does like so many things, like I keep saying, you do need to get some imaging with an ultrasound mammogram. And again, a needle biopsy is helpful just so you know you're following something that's totally fine, totally benign, um, gives you comfort with just feeling that. And then axillary breast tissue, just a little bit about that. There, um, there are, there is a, um, it's not uncommon possibility of um, having breast tissue up under your arm that's separate from your breast, which most, most often you don't notice unless um, during pregnancy or breastfeeding, where just like the breast itself will get tender and swollen, you can end up with the tissue under the arm feeling tender and swollen. Um, again, not any need to do anything if it's a cosmetic issue, feeling like you've got a separate breast hanging out under your arm, sometimes we'll do surgery for that just to make it feel better and look a little better. And it's important for mammogram screening to just be sure that the radiology tech knows that so that area is included within your mammogram. But again, something common that's not at all worrisome. So moving on from breast masses or lumps that you can feel, a discussion about nipple issues. Um, and so nipple discharge, which is very common and very normal. The classic is when you're breastfeeding that you get milk that comes out of your nipple. That's why breasts are there really is to help, you know, is to get uh, women breastfeeding. So during lactation, you can have milky fluid, milk coming out of both nipples, um, which is totally normal. And it's also normal to have um, discharge come from both nipples as long as it's not bloody. And a lot of times women will notice if, if they squeeze their nipple and I'll just say, don't squeeze your nipple. And it's usually stops at that point. Uh, again, it's sort of a reflection of the fibrocystic breast tissue underneath um, that can either kind of lump up and form a cyst or that fluid can come out the nipple. It's just, it's normal breast um, patterns and physiology. Abnormal nipple discharge is not very common, but certainly gets your attention. It's when one breast has discharge and it happens spontaneously. So women will come in and say, yeah, I noticed something on my bra, or often you notice it on your 
nightgown at night from just compressing your, your breast and then it causes a little discharge. If it's bloody or brown, um, it, it's certainly worth seeing um, someone and talking about it. Certainly if there's a mass or skin changes associated with that single bloody nipple discharge that needs to be taken care of. Even though it's abnormal, even though we often end up pursuing it with a biopsy, um, which I'll describe a little further, these are still far and away benign uh, lesions, most likely a papilloma. Um, so of that small subset that have abnormal nipple discharge, it's still a benign finding. It's just uh, something that you need to stop it because you don't like having a uh, bloody nipple discharge. Infections, another uh, way that you can see discharge, especially if um, a woman has an abscess, like I mentioned earlier, so a, like a pus pocket within the breast, sometimes it will drain through the nipple um, just to help to decompress it. And especially very strangely, if a woman's had a nipple piercing, it can drain through where the piercing was. That's abnormal, but again, certainly not cancer related. So when someone comes in with abnormal nipple discharge, um, and describes a single or you know, one side having the problem and that it appears brownish or bloody, that you start with a physical examination like any other time, make sure that there's no lump you can feel that's behind there. Um, and often you can kind of tell which duct the discharge is coming from. And my description is always like, you know, ducts are like spokes on a wheel coming up to the nipple and you can kind of figure out which duct is causing the discharge. Um, mammograms and ultrasounds are really important if you have discharge. And what you're looking with for with ultrasound, you can see the ducts which are behind the nipple. And usually you can't see those, but they can be dilated. And there can be just a little lumpy, warty thing within the duct, which is the papilloma. They're actually pretty easy to take care of because when they're very small like that, the radiologist can do a biopsy and take out the whole thing, prove that it's fine, that there's no atypia, but even more importantly, stop that nipple discharge from happening. If it's not straightforward, I do often order MRI scans because they're very helpful for looking at sources of nipple discharge. Um, Rarely a surgery biopsy is needed if, it, if it's a bigger um, mass or if there's a lump associated with it, or if the discharge keeps happening after a needle biopsy, then I do think about doing a surgical biopsy, again, removing that duct just to be sure that there's nothing there. I'd say my numbers are 97% of the time, it's a benign, totally benign papilloma there's a very small chance of an associated stage zero cancer with it. So if it persists, then it's worth um, investigating further. Other nipple issues, skin changes, which again, most often are something benign like a dermatitis or eczema that a dermatologist is as helpful as a breast surgeon or a breast center for taking care of. But there are times that a dermatologist feels like this isn't really making sense. It's not the rash or whatever's not improving like you'd expect. And then it is worth coming in to see, a, see someone like me who will do again an examination, make sure that there's no lump underneath there, make sure there's no discharge. And occasionally I'll even do a little punch biopsy like a dermatologist will in our office, just to show that it's just inflammation very, very, very rarely, there's a breast cancer that can show up as skin changes. So that's always why we go a little further with skin issues around the nipple, just to be sure there's nothing bad there. And then breast pain, you know, it's interesting, breast pain or nostalgia is the other word for um, breast pain is probably one of the most common uh, reasons that I see women in the office. Um, mastitis is infection, which you really hear about mainly when women are breastfeeding, which improves with antibiotics. But a little bit more about breast pain, since it is so common. And as I wrote down, breast pain, should I worry? So mastalgia, although it really gets your attention, it's rarely a symptom of breast cancer. 
and all my words are, and probably some people have heard this, that I'll say, you know, if your elbow hurt or your knee hurt, you'd never be thinking about anything bad, but your breast hurts and you really worry that there's something bad going on. A cyclical breast pain or cyclical nostalgia is what's associated with the menstrual cycle where both breasts hurt before your period, feel kind of swollen and then get better after, you, after your period. Um, that I don't see very many women for because you go, yeah, that's normal, I expect that. When I end up seeing uh, women with, who are worried about this is the non-cyclical breast pain where you'll come in and say, it just, it persists, it's in one spot, I keep feeling this area. I don't feel a lump there, but I just have ongoing pain there. And so my job in that case, again, my worry about any sort of breast cancer is really low, but I wanna prove that to you if you come in with breast pain because I know it's going to be fine and I just wanna make sure that you know it's fine. So I will order x-rays. You know, Again, mammograms and ultrasounds are our friends. Uh, an ultrasound can be used if you have a very point specific place that it hurts where you go, boy, it hurts right at the top of my breast. You can look with ultrasound and be sure. Sometimes we'll see a deep breast cyst in there that could cause tenderness, but most often you don't see anything but dense fibrocystic -y breast tissue. So my treatment at that point is first just reassurance saying there's nothing bad there. This is just the weird thing that women's breasts do for reasons we don't understand. Um, there's a couple uh, measures that I will recommend, none of which work 100%, but they're all worth trying. One physical support, which sounds funny, is just um, like wearing a sports bra. Just a little bit more support, a little bit more compression can help with that breast pain. And often women who are really, really bothered will wear a sports bra night and day for the period of time where they're um, most, they have the most pain. A Tylenol and anti-inflammatories help, you know, ibuprofen or leave or something like that. And then the other thing that I think will help, and again, there's not science here, but just asper cream or something topical in the area where it's sore. It's like putting Bengay on a sore muscle. It does really help your breast, and it is certainly no harm in giving that a try. I do think there is a benefit for some women of de decreasing caffeine. I, uh, I have found that maybe 50% of women will benefit from decreasing the caffeine in their um, diet. A lot of women look at me and go, yeah, I'm not giving up my coffee. And it's like, okay, that's fine. As long as, you're, as long as you don't worry and fret about this, you can keep drinking coffee because you may not respond anyway to decreasing caffeine. And I usually say about a month. If you don't notice a difference in a month, then you can have your cup of coffee in the morning. Um, Vitamin E does help, again, 50% of women, just the over-the-counter 800 international units. You can take it once or twice a day. That does help breast pain, as does evening primrose oil for some women. And I think it's always hard to know what makes you better, but something makes you better because breast pain gets better on its own. But for women who take hormones after menopause, sometimes switching around your, you know, whatever, um, hormone replacement therapy you're taking can help with the breast tenderness or you know that pain that you have or the other thing is just starting to decrease the amount of um, postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy I think that really does have some benefit for some women rarely if you read about breast pain you can read about tamoxifen or danazole prescriptions I've never given any woman a prescription for any um anything for breast pain, because I do think once you know it's okay, once you know there's not a cancer there, most often you can continue to, um, you know, live and not fret or worry too much about it. And then I wrote patients. I, I think breast pain's a funny thing. It seems to be cyclical, even some, for some women, every spring they get sore and then they get better. I, I don't have a good answer, but I do know that it's Although it's common, it's rarely anything to worry about. So that goes through things that you can notice and come in to see me. I'm gonna not spend a lot of time on abnormal mammograms, but I'm gonna to touch on some because I do see a lot of women who come in after having had a needle biopsy done with a completely benign 
diagnosis, but still need to talk to me, still might need something more done. So it's nice knowing that not all needle biopsies end up with the cancer. So abnormal mammograms, what the radiologist can see. Um, so these are areas that appear abnormal on x-ray and you can't feel anything. Calcifications, I think almost every woman has had calcifications in their breast or had no friend who's had calcifications. And by far and away, these are most often benign fibrocystic changes. There's calcifications that the radiologist will just say, yeah, you've got calcifications, come back in six months. There's some that they'll be a little bit more concerned about and say, yeah, we should do a needle biopsy just to be sure there's not an underlying, uh, usually early stage cancer there. So benign fibrocystic changes are by far and away the most common uh, finding that we see with calcifications. The other ones I've listed, we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, some of them are indicate an increased risk for breast cancer, so it's good to know that. So abnormal mammograms, what the radiologist can see, uh, microcalcification. So ductal hyperplasia, there's, a, you know, again, I don't want to get too in the pathology weeds, especially if a pathologist is listening, but there's ductal hyperplasia, which are just increased cells within the duct of the breast, and that's okay. That can happen. It's under the umbrella of fibrocystic changes. Atypical ductal hyperplasia means those cells, while they've grown to be more, are also funny looking. And when we see atypical ductal hyperplasia, I see a lot of women who've had a needle biopsy of calcifications, gotten a diagnosis of atypical hyperplasia. And that is something that I usually will do surgery just to be sure there's not an adjacent um, cancer there that we did, that didn't get sampled with a needle biopsy. And I'll talk a little bit more about atypical ductal hyperplasia or ADH. This is where it gets confusing because lobular hyperplasia and atypical lobular hyperplasia do not need further surgery, but they are a risk marker for getting a cancer sometime, an increased risk of getting breast cancer at some point in either breast. It doesn't give me a, a spot within the breast to worry about. So you don't need to do surgery to remove that atypical lobular hyperplasia because that part of the breast is no more at risk than any other part. There may be questions about that. Um, same with lobular carcinoma in situ, which sounds even worse than a lobular hyperplasia. And it's, a, it's sort of a bad term because it's not truly a cancer and it's distinctly different than ductal carcinoma in situ, which is a cancer. And lobular ca carcinoma in situ is something that um, it's, when I meet someone, I'll talk about it and I've got a little bit more information about this LCIS, but it does not need surgery because it just is a risk marker for anywhere in either breast, not for the specific place where the needle biopsy was done. A sclerosing adenosis, although it sounds bad, is another word for a type of fibrocystic change, nothing to do about that. And then radial scars or complex sclerosing lesions um, are a benign diagnosis. It's not a cancer. It doesn't increase the risk for breast cancer down the road, but they do look um, suspicious on mammogram or ultrasound. And so often I'll do surgery just to reassure both the radiologist and you, a patient, that there's no cancer there. But once you know it's a radial scar, nothing else there, then um, you don't have to worry about increased risk of breast cancer down the road. So what, what of these increases of breast cancer risk? The atypical ductal hyperplasia in that it says, yes, I have cells in this area that can do ben, um, funny things. And so I take that area out with a pretty simple surgery. I, it's a surgical breast biopsy um, just for to get more tissue than what you get with a needle biopsy. Atypical lobular hyperplasia and lobular carcinoma in situ, it's education much more than more surgery that's needed because those Two findings do increase risk of getting breast cancer in the future. And so not substantially, but enough that it does, uh, it's very important for a woman to know or for you to know that that's what your biopsy showed. And for anyone who's had that diagnosis, I'll say, yes, you need to keep getting your breast exams. 
Um, you need your annual mammogram, which I feel strongly about, even if you haven't had any of those diagnoses. Um, and I'll add automated breast ultrasound, which I think um, one of the radiologists will talk about next at our next time when he talks about um, uh, breast imaging. But again, for women who have dense breast tissue, that's a really nice way of doing screening that's not as involved as MRI scans. And then finally, endocrine therapy um, through with the help of a medical oncologist. For some women, there is a benefit to adding something like tamoxifen to reduce this, the uh, future risk of, a, of developing a breast cancer. And I'd say oh, maybe one in four of my patients end up taking tamoxifen um, with the atypical findings on a breast biopsy. So that's a lot of information. Is anyone, if I know I have some patients on here, they know that I can talk at least a half an hour about any one of those issues and to put them all into about a 20 minute talk is a challenge. But I thought I would close with just saying, what are we, what can we do to help you if you have a breast cancer? Uh, question. So there is a lovely Q&A that, um, that Julie and Sarah are helping with, and so I'll answer questions that you have put in. But really, you can always call the Breast Center at Valley View for any lumps you can feel, skin changes, nipple changes, any confusion with a mammogram, or these pathology results, which I really brushed over quickly, but I do know that um, that can be confusing. And you can get a call from the radiologist or primary care doctors that don't, doesn't completely clarify it. So I'd love to see you for any of those, but I'm um, interested to see what questions you have. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, that was great. Um, we had a lot of comments saying thank you for doing that and it turned out really well. And we appreciate your um, time and effort into this. Um, one question is kind of a two-part question. Someone asked if there's any increased risk of have if you have an inverted nipple. Oh, that's a great question. No. Okay. Um, you know, inverted nipples are really common. I think the only time you really struggle with it is if you're trying to breastfeed, um, and lactation specialists really will help with that. Um, and there's some women are a bit bothered by the cosmetics of it, but in general, if you've had an inverted nipple for your life, it, that's nothing. If you have an inverted nipple that just has shown up recently, then again, it's worth getting a good exam because it is one of the ways that breast cancer can show up, although it's pretty uncommon, but the idea is that the cancer's kind of behind the nipple and pulling it back in. Um, usually if there's a lump there or a cancer there, you'd see it on mammogram or ultrasound. I think you answered the second part, which was, is there any inverted nipple about it? Or should you about it? Yeah, if it's something new, you should, see someone um, and make sure you're up to date. I'm gonna just say that again and again. You have to be up to date with your mammograms. That's where we really do well taking care of any breast issue. And it, you know, that's our, that's, that's our answer right now. Um, but if it's an inverted nipple that you've noticed for your whole life, you don't have to worry about it. Okay. And there was another one about thermography, whether you have an opinion about that. I have a very definite opinion about that. You know, it's, it's, thermography has been around for a long time and it will be a good question for the radiologist when he speaks in um, three weeks or whatever. There's no science behind thermography. And I do have patients who are very concerned about the radiation exposure with a mammogram or the discomfort with a mammogram and they'll spend money, cash money to get a thermogram, which is then impossible to interpret. You know, the idea is it shows hot spots within the breast, but I've had patients who have a known breast cancer who get a thermogram and it shows hot spots all over the place and it doesn't light up where the cancer is. So I have a very strong opinion. It's a waste of time and money. Okay. I think those were most of the questions, unless someone else has any, we did have a comment about the um, pain, the breast pain, and um, she said that she had cut back on caffeine. I don't know. There wasn't really a question in there, but I thought maybe you could have heard that a lot. It's interesting, you know, I think um, it's sort of a, it's a, it's 50-50. You can cut back on caffeine and have less pain, but you can cut back on caffeine, it makes no difference. I think some of that yearly cyclical um, breast pain issue is that women who drink a lot of iced tea in the summer will suddenly have more pain than they have the rest of the year, but that's not really science. So. Okay. Well, I think that is, 
is it. So if you have any extra, any additional questions um, or that did not get answered, we have your email and we can answer those through email. And then I think you have maybe one. Yeah, so I have a couple other things I've been told. So at the end, you will get a survey. Um, and so please fill it out. And I think we're especially interested in what other things you want to talk about. Um, we do, as I sort of outlined, and you might have seen circling, circling around before we started, um, there are, there's a talk by the radiologist coming up. There's a talk about breast cancer diagnosis, surgical treatment of breast cancer, medical, chemo, medical and radiation oncology coming up. And then we're going to talk about lifestyle changes, what you can do to protect yourself from developing a breast cancer, physical therapy. So those are all coming up as part of the Valley View University Breast Center at Valley View. Um, but if there's anything else that we haven't thought of, let us know because um, we're willing and able to, to help educate. And then finally, oh, there's also a link to the recording will be sent out tomorrow. And then the next talk will be the radiologist um, on August 17th. We're gonna keep it at the same time at six o'clock. And he will talk about the five misconceptions of mammogram. And I expect he'll also talk a little bit about automated breast ultrasound and maybe MRI scans. So thanks for taking time while you're busy eating dinner, doing the dishes. I really appreciate you um, listening in and yeah, stay tuned for the next talk. Bye. Oh, I get